Hello, I'm Thomas Carruthers. And I'm Rian Helms. And today is our, not penultimate, what's the opposite to a penultimate? Not the opposite, what's pri- penultimate, penultimate. That sounds stupid. Last but two. <laughs> that sounds even worse. Um, uh, in our month of uh, David Fincher, this is 2011's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. She's one of the best investigators I had, but she's different. Uh, in what way? In every way. Something wrong with the report? Anything you chose not to disclose. He's clean, in my opinion. He's honest. Her credibility isn't dead yet. Mine is. He's had a long-standing sexual relationship with his co-editor of the magazine. Sometimes he pleasures her. Not often enough, in my opinion. No, you're right not to include that. I need your help. You come and stay on the island. A way of avoiding all those people that you might want to avoid right now. You will be investigating thieves, misers, bullies, the most detestable collection of people that you will ever meet. My family. This is Harriet. From the very critically acclaimed uh, and adored by everybody novel um, by Stieg Larsson. Uh, Someone in the family murdered Harriet and for the past 40 years has been trying to drive me insane. Those are from her, and the rest from her killer. You failed to adapt to four foster homes. Were arrested twice for intoxication, twice for assault. How many partners have you had in the last month? And how many of those were men? I should have control of my money. And you will, once you learn to be sociable. Why don't we start with me? You know what to do. I can't find something you've been unable to find in 40 years. You don't know that. You have a very keen investigative mind. You were here that day. A terrible day. Searching and finding. I never found the body. Was it spontaneous? Was it calculated? Did she know something? Someone wished she didn't. The last time I reported on something without being absolutely sure, I lost my life saving. I need a research assistant. I know an excellent one. She did the background check on you. The what? You don't think we could hire just anyone for something like this? A big hit in Sweden, the entire Millennium Trilogy. Everybody loved them. Uh, have you get... read them? No. <laughs> I never have. I um, My grandma has that. I remember her adamantly adoring them and just flying through them and, um, and her offering me uh, them multiple times to read. Uh, I've just never got around to it. Um... It's Mikhail Blomqvist. May I come in? We need to talk. Hey, hey, who do you think you are? Put some clothes on, get rid of your girlfriend. Can I call you Elizabeth? I want you to help me catch a killer of women. I've got absolutely no idea how they're connected to the death of a 16-year-old girl. Don't you need to look over these? I got it. It's better to look at what I am about to show you on an empty stomach. What are you doing? Reading your notes. They're encrypted. Yes. Rape, torture, fire, animals, religion. Am I missing any? The names. I may have some. Nobody likes people poking around in their lives. Everybody knows why you're here. Someone killed her. Someone on the island that day. If a woman approaches any beast and dies with it, you shall kill the woman and the beast. These people are insane. Soon you will know us all, only too well, with my apologies. And I remember we were going through the airport when um, Hornet's Nest was being released, the third novel, and uh, going, Grandma! Is that is that the third one? And she went, oh yes, it is. And she hadn't got she hadn't bought the third one yet, and she bought it. And we, we were going to Barcelona. This is like this is like Alan Bennett's Talking Heads. It's like we were on the, we were in a plane. We were going to Barcelona, and I saw the third novel. Have you read them, Rian? I haven't. I tried to do a little bit of background just to kind mm. of fill the holes in mm. my brain because I I had some 
some burning questions about specifically the end and whether mm. that was setting up sequels yeah well this is the great issue that overhangs over this film and it's really depressing is that um so so all three movies get made in sweden and i own all three swedish movies and they're fine they're definitely enjoyable now there was a big before we get into this actual film there's two big things to discuss in that um, the three movies get made in Sweden and they're, they're critical uh, and big big box offices actually for Swedish movies, mainly for foreign movies rather, um, in English, in the English and US markets, mainly because of the big success of the book. But still, you have the thing of, okay, let's, uh, foreign film's popular, uh, let's remake it in English to get to a wider audience because lots of people just don't watch subtitled movies which is stupid um and there are so 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 many bad versions of this uh and then there's this and then there's the departed and there's and there's others there's like true lies and the birdcage i'm speaking as if there's only a handful there's a lot but i think this sort of got given completely unwarrantedly that thing of um that label of not necessary, not needed. It's just not needed. We have the Swedish one. Have you seen the Swedish film? I haven't, no. This is so much better. That seems it's, to be the, the public opinion. Yeah, it's just... And the biggest defenders of the Swedish one are the ones that, you know, just can't get over... They think it's unnecessary, that we didn't need it. And it's not that it's in the English language... <laughs> It's not that it's, well, no, that's the only thing that people say is, oh, it was just made in English. And it's just so much better. Naomi Rapace is incredible in those original films. That was the big takeaway. She's astounding. She's not as good as Rooney Mara. Every single performance in this film is incredible from the smallest and, and watching all these finches again, just the detail and the ex excellent craft in these in the tiny things the micro and the macro just everything i think it's a flawlessly made film um what would what and this was one that you saw the trailer of and you're like okay this looks interesting i'll do this episode you did you know anything did you i presume you knew of the acclaim around the books um i seen that it was it rose to popularity um i knew nothing of the story mm. and the intricacies. I just thought this looks like a cool crime thriller, and I am a fan of, of like true crime and crime fiction. So you can't beat it. You can't an, an epic, a well done epic mystery thriller. Oof. That being said, <laughs> oh no, one didn't quite do it for me. But we'll get to why. Did it leave you throughout. cold? <laughs> just a tad. <laughs> Oh, that's it. Yeah. And that's the, the, the other part. Oh, no, no. What was I going to say? The other part. Oh, yeah. Two parts. And then we'll get to the third part. The second part of the film's legacy is that it was, you know, originally set up. They were going to make the entire trilogy. And this one just bombs. Nobody goes to see it. Well, no, people obviously do go to see it, but it just doesn't make any money. And I get it. It's heavy. It's long. It's really dark. And it's fucked up. And in many ways, and in many ways, it's so deep and so dark that it's incredible to get sucked in. But it's a rough world to be sucked into for two for two hours forty. Um, and the second two movies got cancelled. I was uh, rewatching uh, all of the special features. And Steve Zalian's talking about, um, the writer of this film, um, he's talking about Elizabeth's backstory. And he says, you know, we'll get to it. I think they completely thought that they were going for a trilogy. And I don't think that affects this movie too much. I think it's a solid film in its own right. And I think that it's a concise film. Obviously, the the Vanger story, nothing's um, left uh, ambiguous regarding the Vanger mystery, regarding the Venestrum stuff. Uh, the only 
the thing that's left ambiguous is the nature of Mikel and Lisbeth's uh, relationship, which is, I think is a fine, ambiguous note to end on. And also, it's not necessarily ambiguous. It, it's a bit of a, yeah, no, they're not going to, they're probably, she's going to go back into a recluse. She's opened herself up to one person and he's went off and had an affair with Princess Buttercup. So he's not going to, you know, uh, who is obviously everything that she is not. Um, which leads us into the third part. Why would, no, why did nobody go and watch this movie? Um, lots of factors, I think. People had seen the Swedish film. And it's just dark. It's a rough watch. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, you know, you're... In broad strokes, can you touch on what left you cold and what, what you enjoyed, if there was anything? Um... So, as you said, obviously it was it had these high hopes to continue the trilogy, and it left things to be not even desired but regretted about the initial ones. So, like the ending, for example, was my main point of contention. Okay. Because I feel like they they worked really hard to kind of give Lisbeth this journey of healing and she's left just pining after a guy and it kind of undermines everything that they were trying to do for her. You know, she's fighting for her agency and her autonomy and mm. she gets it. She, you could say, you know, she's independent by the end, but it's framed in a way that's supposed to make us feel bad about it. Whereas obviously if they'd been able to touch on that ongoing relationship with all its peaks and troughs, mm. I just didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that they get together. <laughs> At all. At all. And I know that's an issue with the book rather than the film. But... Yeah. I know, but you know, we can t it's 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 all one thing. That's fine. Okay, right, yeah. Uh what was your biggest what was your biggest uh issue with well before we touch on this, that's that classic th and it's an argument. I was reading a lot of articles actually. I uh I went really deep into different points of view, uh particularly on um the assault uh sequence and that's uh, you know, subplot, shall we call it, um, and seeing the different critical evaluations of that, because I've, I've, you know, I adore Fincher, so I've heard his commentary track, and I know that his point of view of it, and, and we'll get into a deeper discussion about that later, uh, but just looking at the different points of view, and it's that classic thing of uh, sort of these strong, incredible female characters, and it's, it's that odd conversation that comes up a lot I think is when they're put into relationships and it's and it's that conversation and there's always the same one-two conversation of why does she have to be pining over a man why uh why should she not be pining over a man why if she is this strong three-dimensional character why can't she have romantic issues in her life why do they have to define her and it's that it's always that back and forth. Um, yeah, I feel like people would try and find issue with it either way. I mm. just felt for me, her progress and her humanization almost seems to kind of run parallel with her gaining feelings for Mikkel. And it's like she mm. could have gotten to that point on her own. Yes. I, I guess that there's a there's a sort of bridge in her journey in that he's not uh, the first um, sexual experience she has after her assault. She has the the uh, lesbian encounter after the that great club montage, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, fading to black, fading up, uh, and so there's that sort of um, uh, bridge section. So that it doesn't have the yeah. thing of he's he's come into her life and. Uh, for lack of a better way to say it, his sex has healed her of all of her trauma. Because uh, thats I don't think that's what it is. And I think the whole yeah. film is structured around this beautifully intricate and well-written and structured um, paralleling. Um, and then when they finally do meet, which is an hour and 10 minutes into the film, um, we're, you know, we're off to the races. What did you enjoy? Uh, there were a few, yeah, it had its, its merits. I suppose it comes under you know, 10 minutes stretch. And things let's like go that. to, let's, let's get into the, the structure, the beautiful and intricate structure of our own show. <laughs> um, best YouTube comments. 
They should have called it The Girl with the Dragon Tat, then make a sequel <laughs> called The Girl oh, with the Dragon no. Tat 2. Oh, God. Best thing is that they didn't try to make Salander sexy in a Hollywood way, but stay true to the character. I think that's very true. That is, a, yeah, that is a, an element that I liked because uh, I read up a lot about um, the male gaze in this film mm. and how she kind of uh, is separate from it because of her kind of androgynous mm. look, but you could argue that she's still sexualized quite a lot. And also, yeah, she's sexualized quite a lot, but it's but as you say, it's in the framing of her journey um, of recovery. And also, yeah. she's in complete control every time. I mean, I don't want to ruin a specifically favorite part, but that incredible uh, time they're having sex uh, later in the film, and he's he's thinking about the Harriet mystery, and she's like, "No, no, shut up, just give me a second. Uh, that's just a great moment." And uh, Rooney Rooney sells it marvelously. Um, Looks like Therese went a bit crazy when Carol left her at that hotel. Um, so Joe, for all you Carol fans out there, um, of which there are many, I guess. A half hacker, a half a dozen. A hacker who uses a Mac, hilarious. A joke for all you computer <laughs> fans out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's dive into the body of the film, 10 minute stretch. Oh. Why don't you kick us off with your nominations then? Uh, I really liked the opening. I thought it was strong. There was a lot of good exposition, specifically um, introducing the relationship between Mikkel and I'm not sure who she is. Robin Wright Penn. Robin Wright, yeah. No, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, not Robin Wright Penn anymore. Not Robin Wright in this film. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they could, could communicate that relationship literally like through their eye contact. Mm through eye contact and one, the, the, this film is, so, again, so underrated in regards to writing and exposition. So the fact that you have whole scenes that are just exposition and that they are just as riveting as the character scenes. I mean, obviously it's helped by the fact that it's a mystery and you, we're invested mm -hmm. in the mystery, but it's so hard done. We talked about the, um, on All the President's Men, that movie, is entirely exposition. And the fact that it's as riveting as an action film is insane to me. Um, but yeah, the, the, when, she's, when she says, um, I'll call Gregor that I'm not coming home. You know, there's not, we've been having this affair for five years. <laughs> there's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's somebody I need to call. And it needs to be done. Um, I liked the Leviticus lead where uh, the daughter just like almost in like the biggest twist of fate. He's like, oh, the Bible quotes on your desk. And he's like, shit. And, and also, whole, again, yeah. I think that's very, well, I think it's believable and it's built in throughout with the religious stuff. And that it's not, I don't know. I think, I always think of a few good men when he's, when he's in his closet and he's like, oh, wait, the clothes. Like, that's a really good aha moment. And we've seen <laughs> so many times when aha moments are just terrible. And I think that, again, this seeds it very well um, yeah i like that and then he calls up rebecca no no it's not why i mentioned it <laughs> the swedes I love lovely accent at work in this film i don't think any of them are actually swedish apart from some of the no. i love that uh daniel craig just went didn't bother not gonna bother <laughs> you get what you get Let's move into the positives, I feel. I need to be in a positive zone, because I'm going to be completely honest. This may be my favourite Fincher. I, I, it. It's it's an odd way. It's It's got a lot of deep, dark stuff in it, so it's hard to say. But just so watchable. It just flies by every time. I, I don't know if you'll ever return, if, you, if you're in a mood where you'll ever return to it. But... <laughs> I just, it's just, for me, it's it's so, so, I, and I guess it's sort of an underdog quality of that I want to fight for my, I mean, I love Seven, that's maybe, as, mm -hmm. I mean, I love Gongo, that's literally his biggest box office movie, but yeah. um, I like to fight for the underdog then and again. I mean, Shawshank's my favourite film, so I'm not that big of a snob, but... Um, I feel like this says more about you than it does the film. <laughs> Elaborate on that just a little, uh, so that we're not, <laughs> so that, that that's not ambiguous and looming. 
Um, yeah, I like a thriller. I like a mystery. I love these characters. I love Fincher. I love the dark thing of this, of this, the Nord, of the Nordic. I think it's just an incredible setting. It is, yeah. I like the the whole backdrop of the island and and the bridge and everything. And as I say, the cast is is incredible. Have you got any other nominations for Ten Minutes Stretch? Um, I liked uh, the Harriet reveal and her mm. point of view flashbacks at the end, um, specifically the shot of her leaving over the bridge. Mm. It's yeah, it's really well done. Wonderful, uh, Jolie Richardson, the um, Natasha Richardson's sister, God rest her soul. Um, love Natasha Richardson. When people talk about like lost stars, you know, you know, we, we always jump to the the big names, but for me, it's Natasha Richardson. I, I, I just I adore in uh, Asylum, which isn't an, an exceptional film, but she's wonderful in it. She's great in The Comfort of Strangers, and her Sally Bowles may be the best Sally Bowles <laughs> for being connected. And then obviously she had that terrible skiing accident that took her life. But this is her sister, Vanessa Redgrave, and Tony Richardson's uh, daughter. Daughter. Any other nominations, uh, Reem? Uh, no, nope, those are my three. Let's get the lay of the land then. Um, the Vangers, meeting the Vangers. And uh, wonderful Christopher Plummer, um, who is just... We need a patriarch for a rich family. <laughs> ah, get, get Chris in. Um, it's just terrific. In many ways, Knives Out is a wacky version of the girl with the dragon tattoo that people don't really talk about. I mean, yeah, it's got that dysfunctional family with with the dark mm. past. Except instead of wacky jokes, it's like, oh no, they're, they're literally Nazis. I, I think, again, something really clicked for me this time. And it was that the maybe the whole, th I want to say two things, and I think that will put everything else into a grander context. A, the film doesn't let you look away. And it, it really hit home in the Nazi scene when he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Should we, you know, hide? It? Oh, no, I'm going to keep my Nazi photos up. I was a Nazi. Everybody else is bullshit. They're hiding everything under a shiny veneer like an Ikea table. I'm the most honest of them. Who? In the family? Sweden. And, and it's that sort of thing of, we're not going to hide anything. And there's a very specific choice that, that I'll touch on later. Um, but another thing that colours this entire film, um, the original title of the novel is Men Who Hate Women. It is. And that's just a completely, I mean, it's a very obvious context for anybody who's taking notice, but this entire film is about misogyny and when that becomes, and when that takes its horrific, violent consequences. Um, all of the women that Michael, um, that Martin and his father kill are, as he describes them, immigrant whores. They're either prostitutes or sexually, um, not for, sexually, you know, sexu sexual women, just going about liberated. their Liberated. Liberated, exactly. I was going to say frivolous, <laughs> but um, <laughs> liberated is the word. Um, they must be punished. That's the whole thing. I mean, the the assault is its own, just the psychopathy of um, just abuse of power, uh, not even in the workplace, in, in fucking childhood um, uh, ward states, just abuse of power against people. Um, and Martin can't figure it out. And the fact that Elizabeth comes in, and the, as soon as Elizabeth comes in, every this is what this is. We are figuring this out. It's it was Ma it's Michael's biggest selling point. Um, I want you to help me to catch a killer of women. It's great stuff. Uh, ten minute stretch. Uh, meeting meeting Martin, um, who's still in Skarsgård. Another very underrated performance. We'll get to the Oscars. Oh, we'll get to the Oscars. It was nominated for five Oscars, um, but just. Exceptional work. It makes rewatches of Mamma Mia very disturbing. Um, oh God, yeah, I bet. Yeah, Bill Anderson. Because every time he says Bill Anderson, I think of when he says Lena Anderson. Ah, oh, Lena, that was such a long time ago. 
I think I honestly, it's, again, this is bizarre, but the scene of uh, <laughs> Martin and Michael just talking, maybe my favourite stretch of this entire film, incredible dialogue, incredibly delivered by two actors doing exceptional work. And it's not too, and it's so clever and it's not, and it's subtle in the right ways and it's obvious in the right ways and it's brutal always. Which leads us into uh, the revenge uh, of the assault. Uh, just a really brutal, fantastic, uh, <laughs> just the, the sound design of the kicking of the gold dildo has stuck with me <laughs> since I was a very young child. Oh, God. Um, the fact that you're watching this as a young child as well. I wasn't a young child. I was 12. I, when did this come out? 2000, uh, no, no, this didn't come out in 2011, did it? It did, yeah. <laughs> that is terrifying. It's not terrifying. No, my mum would, no, my mum would skip a lot. It was, she skips a lot, don't worry, Christ. But, um, no, because it was like I, the mystery. I was more invested in the mystery in the filmmaking. It's like when Wolf of Wall Street came out and everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Margot Robbie's got a tip out. I was like, yeah, but what about the edits? And people <laughs> didn't believe me. I was literally saying, can I watch Wolf of Wall Street? Because I want to know if Scorsese will win his Oscar. And uh, I want to know if Leo will get his Oscar. And people just, and people were like, no, it's about drugs and boobs. And it's about, no, it's about so much more. It's about the excess and... Tom, what you should be, uh, yeah. But uh, again, then with this, it was the thriller and the mystery. I think I've seen seven before. Maybe, maybe bad, but I don't know. I, I yeah, but th but then also, <laughs> dig the hole deeper. Go on. <laughs> That's what this film is. It's about digging deeper into the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I love. Elizabeth and Michael figuring out it's Martin. And that I love that this movie is entirely just an investigation of old Polaroids and files. Yeah. That it's this, this smashing together of the most, uh, you know, the best tech you can ever have. And you've got this incredible hacker. But at the end of the day, it's some old woman who was on her honeymoon and she took a photo. And it's some old Nazi, some nice lads, landscapes some nice landscapes in there <laughs> it's some old nazi who is very proud of his candid photography and that's what brings down martin martin it's a science of a thousand details um leads us into my favorite to stretch the torture um and then the flashback with harriet when we come to realize the truth and then the entire <laughs> epilogue of this 20 minute epilogue of this film where Irene um, well Elizabeth as Irene brings down <laughs> Benistrom just as a so, favour just so many endings they were like Ooh. right shit we're at the two hour mark we've got to tie up as many of these endings as we can yes but do you feel I don't know maybe it's because I've watched it so many times so I know that there's another <laughs> so I know there's another 40 left but yeah. do, did it did it feel did it feel dragging to you or were you not invested? Um, it wasn't so much that it felt like it was dragging, but it was kind of like for me, it didn't really put enough emphasis on what was the central plot. Like mm. you know, the title is the girl with the dragon tattoo. Yes, and so I felt like there would have been more light shared on Lisbeth. But then it, it made it clear that, you know, it was about this investigation mm. and them solving this this murder. And so then to have, you know, Mikkel's reputation be the, the final point of the whole thing was like, oh, I'd forgotten that was even a thing. But Lisbeth... <sighs> A? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's not just oh Mikael's reputation. It's Elizabeth, you know, fuck it up, fuck it up, shit. <laughs> it's Elizabeth doing some bankers fraud and getting a nice wig, and and going around the world. And it, so we're again we're it's the girl with the dragon tattoo. We're following Elizabeth as she wrecks Venistrom. Not just for Mikael because she's clearly seen that this Venistrom is a bad guy, uh, and uh, again uh, she's bringing down uh, powerful men abusing their power. 
this time not against women, but um, and not serial murder. But um, again, she's bringing down somebody. And also, I think that in actuality, the looming thing of Venestrum never leaves us because it's why Mikkel's doing the Wanger. It's why Mikkel's doing the Wanger investigation. We have the five minutes sort of in the middle where they buy the magazine. Um, I don't like bullies. Are you referring to Herr Venestrom? I'm referring to anybody who sues their enemies into submission. <laughs> and we have that sort of link. Robin Wright coming and going, yeah, no, we've got three months left. Um, and, then, and then obviously we do move more into the Harriet investigation, which Lisbeth then comments on when she goes, you know, unfortunately Martin and Harriet fucking Vanger have been keeping me busy. I love her disdain uh, when she, throws that one out go on say but no it's boring who cares about a magazine's libel suit do the murder and make it an hour and a half it just seemed like a strange <laughs> note to end on mm. you've just uncovered a 40 year old murder y yeah I guess um, yeah but they've uncovered a 40 year old murder but it doesn't affect them it's their lives. I, I like the and, and then I know that you've got a sour point about them, about it being about her pining over a man. But hmm. and then you have the lovely note of her going to see the um, the chess man, uh, her initial ward who's had the stroke and going, no, no, I, I'm I'm happy. You, I've made a friend. She doesn't say I've got a, I've fallen in love with him. She's just I made a friend. I do fuck, and. That's the thing. If it had been a platonic relationship that still, mm. you know, becomes the catalyst for her progression, that would have been fine. Mm. It's just they had, I felt like it was, it, it cheapened it by making it sexual. Mm. And for, for him to be the one that ends up pieing her off inadvertently. Just, well, that's the thing, isn't it? He just, he thinks it's, um, he thinks that it's just going to be done with the Vanger thing, maybe. They've found Harriet Vanger and now he's going to go back to Millennium and Robin Wright. Which, you know, is perfectly reasonable. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I guess, yeah, but does it also come from a point of, I mean, it sounds like you're not rooting for them, but are you not rooting no, for them? No, I'm not. This? I know, but are you not rooting for Elizabeth to be happy? I am. I'm just saying she can. She she should have that happy ending mm. without the gratification that a, a man is bringing her. I don't. I'm not saying that she. I mean, she could have ended up with nightclub lady. Yeah, she could have done. Yeah, where have you been? <laughs> it's a long story. Cut to black. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's all framed by a coffee meeting. I remember the summer of 2011. It never crossed my mind to stop people calling me Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thomas Whittler's specific favourite parts of the film. I love him going back on his cigarette habit when he, when he, uh, when he buys the packet of cigarettes and the lighter. It, again, incredible exposition that he has to buy the lighter. We know that he's quit. Yeah. And then he just takes one. Throws the rest away. Throws away. Again, bringing up Martin's talking about murder, it's a science of a thousand details. I think if, if, you, if, if you're going to talk about Fincher with one quote, that's the one. Yeah. Fincher's filmmaking is a science of a thousand details. That's just one of them. I love how Christopher Plummer says, bullies, <laughs> bullies, <laughs> misers. Um, that reveal of the flowers, incredible. Also, we're, we're, we're lamenting that, you know, it's not all about abuse of women. He's got a happy ending. Harriet got out. That's, she did. It's not like, you know, some bittersweet, oh, and then, yeah, no, I did kill Harriet. Yeah, I did kill Harriet too. <laughs> she was another yeah. one. It was, an, it's a, in a way, it's not, you wouldn't think of it as a nice ending, but it's a nice ending. And also, there's a mutual respect between Elizabeth and Michael. Hashtag Elizabeth and Michael. Um, I'm sure. I literally think if we spent less than five minutes on YouTube and we typed in Elizabeth and Michael, there'd be a, a love-like montage 
set to like, I don't know, some shitty acoustic oh, God, song. Yeah. People... Fan edit to Paramore, you are the only exception. I don't know that song. Uh... You don't know? Come on. No. I don't, I know um, the incredible version of Immigrant Song that kicks off this film. That by, was that was my favourite my favourite song. By Karen O. What? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've got to think about that later, haven't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> the flower reveal. Um, Although just, I did, um, I watched the Cinema Sins commentary of this. Not oh, too well. Uh, did they do? Did they, did they do one? Um, and they brought up a good point, and it was why is Harriet continuing to send these flowers? Because it's not for peace of mind, because Henrik already thinks she's dead. So it's really just driving him crazy. No, and she's like, I'll send another. She No, she doesn't think that he's dead. Sorry, uh, uh, she, he doesn't think that she... Uh, she... <laughs> she doesn't think that he thinks that she's, she's dead. dead. She thinks that he thinks that they're missing. Uh, and that maybe if I send her the flowers, then he'll be like... Oh, she's alive. She's somewhere. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird move. <laughs> Instead, he's jumped straight to her killer. Got really good at this. Well, you would make that, wouldn't you? Like it's that's what again. That's another <laughs> incredible moment of the film. Yeah, what a great twist. Yeah, no, I sent the flowers because I still loved him. But you completely believe that it's the serial killer's weird perversion. I mean, that's an inc now. If you want to open a film. You open it up with Christopher Plummer on the phone talking about a pressed flower going, another one, yes. Then, Postmark? No. no, no. <laughs> and then kick in Immigrant Song with that incredible opening opening sequence. How are you not sitting through to uh, another two hours 38 <laughs> after that two minutes? Um, it did grab me, I must say. I, see, I was hooked. It's great. Did you guess that it was Martin? No. Did no, you I guess didn't. that Harriet was still alive? Um, I, it did cross my mind, mm. but I didn't, I didn't put two and two together and come up with Anita. How's your sex life? I didn't care much for your last report. It felt perfunctory, like your heart wasn't in it. Let's see a little more enthusiasm for my recovery in next month. <laughs> don't speak. I don't want to hear your voice, just nod. Start looking for a shrink you can bribe to swear under oath you can find absolutely nothing wrong with me. And stop visiting tattoo removal websites. Or I'll do it again. Right here. Um, I love the floor cleaner. Again, this is where we get into specific details. Mm -hmm. But um, during the first assault, the sound design of that floor cleaner, and it just, mm, and then slowly distorting. And then afterwards, cut back to it just normally. Mm, she walks past it. And that incredible scream in the elevator, uh, which leads us to the upside down shot, where we're now on a re on a rewatch. We know that she's like, okay, I can do that again to give me the leverage needed to never have to deal with him again. And then it comes, uh, what comes of that comes of that. Uh, the photo reveal, uh, when he realizes that she's looking at something and he takes his glasses down. I don't usually, you know, want to add Oscar categories, but an, an, an added Oscar category for best use of a prop would definitely go glasses. <laughs> to Daniel Craig's glasses work in this film. Astounding. <laughs> They're everywhere but his face. <laughs> there, just hanging down. Round his neck, <laughs> on his head. Wonderful glasses work. And um, it's weird that he takes them off to focus on something. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, just so he can get that villainous squint. <laughs> Daniel Craig's great. This I've I love Daniel Craig, I have to say. I, I, I of the Bonds, he's probably my favourite. I like those Bond movies. Um, yeah, no, and this is the sort of movie, this and, and, and Knives Out, I know people have talked about his accent in Knives Out, I think it's really fun, really intentional and really great, um, but it's, these sort, it's this sort of movie, mo movie, this sort of movie where I'm like, oh yeah, give Daniel Craig a serious role again, you know, give him like a really dark thriller again. <laughs> 
Yeah. He's, ooh, he's a bit like a Michael Douglas. I'd believe him in like a fatal attraction role where you're like, oh yeah, you're charismatic, but you're a dirtbag. You would cheat on your wife, but I'm still rooting for you. That'd be really good. Don't remake Fatal Attraction. Don't touch it, but do a, <laughs> do a version of, I'd be into it. I love him shouting, cat! Uh, and then I love the reveal of the dead cat. I thought he says the F word. Yeah, no, before, when he first, when he, when he, before the cat dies, and he's like, and he's like, cat! Oh, okay. And then he, and then when he finds the cat, it, again, great glasses work. He's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I love when he's bad with the computer and Rooney just closes her eyes because she can't bear it. He's like, oh, no, and there, and no, nope, that's down there. <laughs> uh, a moment I already touched on the old Nazi going, some nice landscapes there. Landscapes. <laughs> some nice landscapes uh the uh pressing down on the question mark and her little oh, crick of the neck um Mikhail, come inside i'll pour you a drink that just flawless well, some of the best villain work i've ever seen is is stellan scar's got in this we'll we'll do better with a gun what we'll do better with a gun let me go hunting Bring your drink, leave my knife. And it's the Swedish angle. It's, it's the that angle. line. <laughs> it, that line did did redeem this movie for me in part. And the rope, the and he, and he falls up on the rope. That's incredible. Um, to, uh, these are really specific moments. Um, Lena, Lena, just that odd lament and the the gel. And he rubs his hands aside science of a thousand details. Um, and there's a, there's a secure file. And, it's on a, and he starts mimicking me. There's a secure file. And that's a lie. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, into the bag blow. In cue with Orinoco flow. The... <gasps> boom, 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 boom. Did you like the use of Orinoco flow? Again, that was in my soundtrack corner vote. <laughs> Best use well, of Enya. Is, Enya could, makes every film better. Ooh. But this is just so perverse. <laughs> it's brilliant. I, I, I want to know, is it Enya's greatest hits? Or is it just Orinoco Flow? Is that always his murder song? Or does he have a, a, a mixtape? Is it Shuffle? <laughs> no, it's... Can he, listen, can he listen to it? Can he bear to listen to it outside of his killings? Oh, yeah. What, what if Daniel Craig's in the car... An Orinoco phone comes on. Not Daniel Craig, Mikael Blomquist. Um, but great names. Mikael Blomquist. Lisbeth. Lisbeth, I like that. I like that name. Um, uh, the just one second, let me uh, let me finish. Uh, and I love literally the definition of specific favorite part, her wiping the lipstick off the cup. Um, and my specifically my favorite part of the entire film, uh, it didn't work. I'm here. Oh, but Mikhail, it did work. You're here. Great. Uh, Reen, do you have any little specific, specific or general favourite parts? I do. Um, I liked the elevator fight. Mm. I, I mean, it, it kind of, it was, it was an establishment of her character's nature that we didn't really need because it was self-explanatory. The escalator or the elevator? Escalator, my uh. bad. Because that's another great one where she goes to the it elevator. Yeah. She's like, stop using, stop looking at tattoo removal sites. Incredible. That was good. I'll put it that was good. here, right there. Great stuff. Um, I really liked the car explosion at the end. Mm. When there was something quite just about him dying before Elizabeth could get there. Because mm. in one sense, it's like, she's absolved of responsibility you know her own hate and trauma isn't going to ruin her life because she's not going to go down for this but also it's like nature's taking its course you know this is yeah. a bad dude um he bursts into flames <laughs> yes uh, he gets a pretty bad he gets a pretty bad death it's it's, uh, does, it's very satisfying well that's another thing is that <laughs> um 
they everybody gets their due and we um, and and the fact that we get to relish in them getting their due mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily justify depictions of certain things but i think adds a greater context to it and it sort of puts it in the context of we saw all of that now we're going to see all of this and and again enjoy is a strong word because she is psychotic it's a very justified revenge but she's fucking going for it with mm -hmm. the with the again with that sound design of that gold um and that kick oh, we <laughs> um which leads us into soundtrack corner we've got uh two really uh we've got orinoco flow and immigrant song this is a tough this is a tough battle Two I mean, I would say, yeah, I'd say Immigrant Song is favourite. Mm. And then Orinoco Flow, best use. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just do, 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 do. It's an easy. <laughs> like, I, I, I had to do a fucking month and a half of, of um, capoeira. And the, 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 um, Warm up was to an Enya great like playlist, and every time Orinoco Flow came on, I just <laughs> just said, Lena, my father, my father Gottfried, just great names again, great names Gottfried, Harriet, Martin, um, Oscar Travesty. Now, um, for me, again, this is a <sighs> This is a tough, so it gets nominated for five. It ties with The Descendants for five nominations. Uh, then War Horse and Moneyball get six. Then The Artist and Hugo, uh, Hugo gets 11, because obviously it's got a lot of the special effects ones. Uh, the Artist gets 10 nominations. Obviously that's the overall winner. Um, mm -hmm. Come best picture time. Uh, of course this was Harry Potter's year as well. Yeah, yeah. the final time for that, yeah. Uh, did we, as a Harry Potter fan, bit of a tangent. Are you were you annoyed that Deathly Hallows Part Two didn't get the sort of Return of the King sort of looking at? Because um, it's not the best film. No, but I think it wrapped up the franchise in a way that people were really happy with, to the point that it didn't really matter about the accolades because you knew oh, gosh, people yeah. were watching it. You knew it was going to be a success. Mm -hmm. You knew it was going to be a memorable one in the hearts and minds of the audience. So I wasn't that bothered. Um, Do you think that like Lord of the Rings, if it was the best film, as well as being this um, conclusion, do you think it would have had, a, had, a, had any Oscar chances? Because Lord of the Rings won Best Picture. Lord of the Rings won Best Picture. People forget this. I mean, they don't forget it. Yeah. But like, weird film people don't forget it. But most people forget that Lord of the Rings... Everybody talks about all these Marvel movies and everything. And none of them are deserving of nominations, in my yeah. personal opinion. Well, not Best Picture anyway. But I um, think Best Picture, it could, have, it, it, it could have been in the running or visual effects. Which it did get nominated. But it lost it to Hugo. Um which is understandable. Film editing, couldn't mm. agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, it also gets nominated. That's, we talk about sound. It should have won there. I know, I know I'm being crude about the, the um, kicking, but this film is impeccably designed sound-wise. Mm -hmm. Those haunting little, uh, like echo-affected um, readings of the Bible. Um, this is the great year where there's only two nominations for Best Original Song. Uh, oh. Manor, Manor and Muppet and Real in Rio. Uh, Manor and Muppet, one of the greatest uh, best, bitch, best Original Song winners of all time. Best songs of all time. <laughs> yeah, full stop. Uh, however, though, why wasn't, this a, why wasn't this a La La Land situation? Why didn't the Muppets get three nominations? Life's a Happy Song. That's true. Life's a Happy Song. And Me Party. Crazy. I'm not going to sit around by myself and wait for you. Haven't you heard? <laughs> One is a new two. Uh, have you seen the uh, the trait? Speaking of the Muppets being in the set, released in the same year as the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Obviously, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo has one of the most incredible teaser trailers of all time, mm -hmm. um, set to that astounding immigrant song cover. Um, 
And so for the Muppets, they did in their original advertising campaign, they did a version of uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trailer. And it's set that is to. Incredible. It is incredible. And it's like, it's not easy being green. It's very, very, very fun. Uh, it combines my two favorite things. <laughs> 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 uh, Woody wins for Midnight in Paris, which isn't his best screenplay, but does uh, give him the. Uh, I think that's when he gets the um, record for most best original screenplay wins. I'd actually have to give it to Bridesmaids, uh, even though it needs a trim. It doesn't need to be that long. Yeah, I found that. That's all. But also get get a goddamn nomination for Girl the Dream Tattoo. I think it got pegged out by Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. People only had time for one epic mystery over two and a half hours <laughs> based on an acclaimed novel starring British people that's very confusing. I actually don't think this movie is confusing. Maybe it's because I've seen it a lot, but I don't think this is exceptionally com oh, confusing. Oh, it is. It's quite confusing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, maybe it's okay then. <laughs> well, I understood it when I was 11. No, um... <laughs> What was what was your what was your com biggest com points of confusion on a first watch? Just the the sheer amount of names. I was like, yes. which one's Vernish from again? Dark Froda. Yeah, <laughs> McKelly and Martin. Would it have been easier? They need to do like for first watchers. They need to do an edit where they just say the actors' names. Yeah. Well, um, when. They had the scene where he's jotting down all the names of the Vanga family. And he's like, I'm, you know, I'm struggling to remember it. all these names, you know, as a way of like, mm. oh, this is what the audience is thinking. And then Hendrick's just like, too bad. Yeah. In a few years. <laughs> yeah. In it's a... just like a flip off to the audience. Like, mm, in a while, you're going to wish you could forget us. No, I wish I understood who you all were. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is my Oscar travesty. Really? When people ask me, what's your biggest Oscar travesty? I usually always say Rooney Mara losing to fucking Meryl Streep for the for the, for the Iron Lady. See, the Oscars, they, they love a biopic. It's like crack to them. She got the nomination. For me, that's the hard part, is getting in that five. Who's looking at this list of five and going... Mm, it's Meryl for the Iron Lady. Glenn Close in Albert Nobbs. What? Viola Davis in The Help. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of critical reappraising uh, re of The Help in recent years. I still think, all in all, it's a it's a solid drama. I, w I ended up re-watching it um, with a friend who had really gotten into how to get away with murder. And so they wanted to see Viola Davis's film work. And I do. I think, yeah, yeah. It's the, and, we, and, and we noted one point... Um, where it was, and it was like Octavia Spencer dealing with her abusive husband. And it was, bec and then in the narration, it says, it, it was because Jessica Chastain said, you should get away with it. I was like, okay, no, that's, 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 the, and obviously Emma Stone's character is the epitome of a white savior complex in a, in a film. Um, but all in all, I, I, I have to say that um, I thought it's actually uh, aged not as badly as people think. And um, it's, a, it's a fine drama, but again, an Oscar front runner? I, I mean, it's, I mean, well, let's be honest, it's built for it. Um, and the light's on, but nobody's home. Um, but for me, it's, it's really, there is, we've not really, we've touched on her, but we've, I don't think outwardly, ooh, she's back, uh, but I don't think we've outwardly talked about or at least I haven't, and I don't know how you'll feel, how exceptional Rooney Mara is in this film. How truly... She is incredible. Uh, astoundingly good. And it's, Yeah, you know, I mean... Go on. She, she, she perfectly captures, you know, the hardness of her character and the life that she's led, while also conveying her age pretty accurately. Mm. You know, the kind of the juvenile defiance and, you know, defensiveness mm. that is not only a product of her trauma, but of just how young she is. Yeah, uh, just just exceptional work. 
And then you look at that, and then you look at Carol, and there's a weird moment where where she turns into Irene near the end to to bring down Venistrum. Uh, oh yeah, ten minutes of of, of bank details, uh, <laughs> very exciting. Uh, but um, uh, and she turns into Irene, and we look at her, and it's like, oh yeah, Rudy Mara, we're like. I've not. I've been watching Rooney Mara because we're used to Rooney Mara. Obviously, I, I'm, she's. It's not that she's not beautiful as Elizabeth, uh, but she's a very beautiful woman, Rooney Mara. She look, you know, in in Carol, when she's doing the whole fifties thing, I, I, she looks astounding. And in um, Social Network, Fincher cast her because um, she was. He wanted Catherine Ross in The Graduate. He wanted that squeaky clean thing, and that's why he was initially resistant to casting her as Elizabeth. Um, but she's incredible and incredibly dark. And um, I hope by this time of this episode's release, um, her and Joaquin are still the weirdo power, power couple of Hollywood. I forgot about that. Yeah. I don't, they're either married or they have a kid. It's, it's one or the other. Maybe by this time they've got both and they've got loads of kids. <laughs> but by no, this time next year. By this time next year. But no cows, but no cows, eh, Joaquin? Do you yeah. remember when Joaquin won his Oscar? So I talking about cows. Went on a big vegan tirade. I respect it, honestly. Oh, yeah, you do. You know, you're you? gonna you're gonna talk about something. <laughs> and then, yeah, has he converted Rooney? I don't know. She's eating a lot of McDonald's in this movie. That's a great detail. I don't know how they got the the clearance from McDonald's to, to just have eat <laughs> Happy Meals all the time. Have a Happy Meal. Put your Happy Meal down, and then put the duct tape and, and zip ties that you're going to assault your rapist with you know incredible shot incredible it, it's wonderful but happy meal down zip dies duct tape again um, just you know a seamless convey of her age and the age mm. that she reverts back to when faced with any kind of trauma because you know she mm. said that she tried to kill her dad when she was 12 yeah so you are going to sink back into that mental age every mm. time got 80 percent of him woof uh best single minute talked about the uh epic intro um indeed the house rundown that you were talking about where everybody's confused just very well shot and and really well acted and he those... lives over there she lives over there and he's not talking to her and but, but i don't talk to him because he talks to, to him and they're all Nazis. <laughs> Except for me. I'm not a Nazi. If, as a matter of... Oh, my God. We know why he's not a Nazi. Because oh he fought hard to stop the Nazis in 1944 when he, was, when he met a young nun named Maria. <laughs> oh, my God. That most ambitious crossover in history. Oh, this is... Who, yeah. We never meet. We never meet Martin's Martin's wife or partner. Well, presumably, you never. Ha we, there's no mention of. I think that's another element, obviously, of why he loves Harriet so much. Is that maybe you know I don't want to get too Freud. Just because a man doesn't have a child doesn't mean that every person he loves is a child to him. But um, you know, he, he never had a daughter himself, and obviously the is this, care. Uh, Henrik. Henrik, yeah. yeah. Henrik Henrik Wanger Henrik. Yeah, it seems like a him. weird breach for him to have this relationship with his grandniece, but you know, mm. you you would gravitate to the only person in your family who you feel you can trust. So it just happened to be him. And as he says, you know, 
the mother wasn't any good to begin with and then she became a yeah. terrible drunk after and you know not that he knows the full extent of what Harriet's living through but um yeah that's the point obviously no obviously Henrik knows nothing but does he send something because he sends Martin away from her he's does he he sends Martin to um, boarding school yeah I feel like he would at least have an inkling because they were so close. Actually, no, I'm taking that entirely back because he because he he great Martin's the only person he likes. Uh, he would yeah. I don't think he would like he would not be friendly with Martin and give him the company. Which is another it's another reason why it's such a good reveal, because Martin's in many ways one of the only ones that we like as well. Yeah. To, only... be, to be honest, I, I suspected Henrik from when he said Oh yeah, you know. Oh, even though you, you can't leave the man who hires an investigator mm. off the suspect list. And I'm like, why have you said that? <laughs> and, then he's, and then he's got his stroke. And you're like, wait a minute, you've hired Christopher Plummer to do two scenes. Because um, that's, maybe that's something that's going against the Martin reveal, is that it's Stellan Skarsgård. And you're like, wait, they've hired Stellan Skarsgård, but also he's been in a lot. And everybody is well cast. And sort of there's lots of big actors in smaller roles. So it, exactly. that's always my mother's go-to. She's made a she's made a working she's made a living out of it. When we watch TV shows, she's like, mm, she's she's big, she's yeah. big. She did it. <laughs> um, where are we in this bloody show? Oh, highlighting. Um, even though what even though one of my changes is how much Daniel Craig highlights uh, the uh, police file, uh, that's a beautiful montage. It's literally then, every line. Though. Every line, and then he leaves. Uh, no sign the, of breaking. <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm sure that's pretty, like, that's pretty, noteworthy. That's literally a joke from Schitt's Creek when Alexis is highlighting every line of her, <laughs> of her um, uh, school text. Um, I love the hospital meeting room where they're, trained, where they're talking and discussing whether to resuscitate Henrik. And it's like, we, when we want a family chronicle by a libelist, we'll know who to call. <laughs> you can't smoke in here. <laughs> the sniper shot and the stitching of that um, into into sex. Uh, the Nazi <laughs> landscape, so nice landscape. <laughs> uh, the, the the bridge chase, incredible. You don't get many full blown action sequences from Fincher, but you know I'm not surprised that he can do that just as well as anything else. And uh, I know it's your biggest issue with the film, but for me, it's it's the best single minute is that beautiful haunting motorbike ending and the, the fancy jacket that she's must be a very good friend. Yeah. Give Hello. over. <laughs> <laughs> Have a day off. What can I say? Uh, any nominations, Rian? For? Best single minute. Oh, yes. Um... I liked Mikel and Elizabeth's meeting. Mm. Like, I'm the guy who knows who you know more about than my closest friends. Which will lead to one also, of my best lines in the next comment. But. Does he have friends? Really? <laughs> like he's got a mistress. Probably <laughs> lost most of his friends when he cheated on his wife. Yeah. And also, surely they're all in the same circles. How does it ruin his marriage but not hers? Are they, did it not ruin hers because the husband forgave her and thinks that it's not happening? Because I don't think there's any glimpse, I don't think there's any, I you know, exposition that it's a polyamorous relationship and that he's okay with it for her to just go off with Daniel. Well, I mean, she's shagging him and he's now getting with Elizabeth as well. So yes. I feel bad for poor Gregor if he winds up riddled with something. Yeah. Poor Gregor. Hashtag poor Gregor. What? Poor, <laughs> poor, you know, Gregor in Go with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, Hashtag who played G2. who? Who played him? It was like, oh, was that was that some Skarsgård's character? Is that? Like, no, no, no. He's that one guy at the at, for who was on screen for thirty seconds with his arm around Robin Wright. Oh yeah, Robin Wright was in that film. So she's Gregor. No, 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 no. Greg is her husband, but uh, she has an arm around. No, 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 no. 
You know, when Stephen Burkoff, acclaimed playwright, uh, playing Dirk Froda, calls Daniel Craig on Christmas Day. I think you've seen it too many times, Tom. Uh, I think nobody's thought about Give the Drink to Two since it came out. That's the other thing about the ending. You can't even say that, oh, you know, she's letting him go off and be happy where he's meant to be. They're having an affair. Yeah. That's not going to end well. <laughs> no. I think it's I think it's more so the thing of just like she didn't it's a betrayal of trust even though it's all affairs and everybody's having it off with everybody it's like oh the emotional pact yeah that like, he unknowingly made yeah and he's in actually in actuality he's just a dog um yeah. he's just a cad old martin um michael jesus christ you've got me now um <laughs> Michael. Um, best line. It's hard to believe that the fear of offending can be stronger than the fear of pain. Do you know what? It is. Really? Bring your drink. Leave my knife. <laughs> may I kill him? Oh, <laughs> I did not like may I kill him. That would have... That oh, didn't you? Rubbed me the wrong way. Why? Oh, because... because She's taken so many liberties of her own accord. No, she's just double checking that he's a serial murderer. So she could be like, it's definitely him, right? All right. I'm going to pop a cap in his ass. You know, like. (laughs) No, she's just like, if it comes to it, if it comes to it, can I, may I, may I kill him? May I? Even can I would have been somewhat better. It's just not Lisbeth. It's not her style. I'm sorry. Yeah, kill him. Yeah, kill him. She hit yeah. him with a five iron. <laughs> she did. That's a really good sound design as well. Hearing the teeth come out. Oh. oh. And you know, if she'd have stopped and been like, "Can I? Can I do this?" <laughs> can I, yeah. She's she's sorry. spent enough time already. Like, what? Watching him leave. You <laughs> pu- just pull off the bag and go. All right, I'll give you that. Um, Thank you. You'll be investigating thieves, misers, bullies, the most detestable collection of people that you will ever meet. My family. That's a real trailer line, but it's, it's good. good. It's good. good. This movie maybe has the best trailer lines ever. Mm. It's just so many are wonderful. Nice. Go on, sorry. Um, occasionally he would perform kind of lingers, not often enough in my opinion. <laughs> that is good. I want to know what uh, it... <laughs> What does what does Burkoff say? I want to know uh, if there's anything that I might find unsavoury, even if you don't. <laughs> and then, yes, you're also, right. That shouldn't have been he, in the fight. Like, why does that matter? The gonna linger. He's gonna be no uh, finding anything unsavoury if he's a private investigator. This isn't gonna go anywhere. No, the the thing unsavoury. I just think he's like really old fashioned, and it's like if he's gay or if he's like. I don't know. Mm. I get. I got that impression of like, yeah. you know, you're clearly, you do, you have, you know, is he is he a goth? Is he a big, you know, tattoo? <laughs> is he a Nazi sympathizer? Because that won't bode well with this particular yeah. job. Is, it, is he a Nazi? Oh, I was hoping he was oh. a Nazi. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, you could nod. It's true. I am insane. Um, you know, we're not that different, you and I. We both have urges. Satisfying mind requires more towels. Wonderful. Um, also, honourable mention. Who is the blurry one? I can't see. Of course, of course, you can't. <laughs> also, <laughs> to say that he's an investigative journalist, um, Mikel is very upfront with a lot of random people about the brutal murders that are happening. Like that some poor woman who's like. Um, can I have a copy? Instead of just saying, can I have a copy of this photo? I'm doing an article. It's like, no. The minute that this photo was taken, that woman was brutally murdered. And, yeah. her, and, no. I, and there are other, 10 other women who have been killed and they're all Bible verses. Look at this. Um, really unnecessary. <laughs> just kind of tainted her honeymoon. Not, not the most unnecessary thing he does, but we'll, we'll get to that in What's the Change. Yeah. We're in What's the Change. I'm going to throw out a few picnicky things and then we'll move to a larger conversation <laughs> and then we'll move to your more picnicky things. Okay. Um, I've got Michael's highlighting, Craig accent. The most unnecessary thing Mikel does is just very out of the blue, show 
a victim of multiple years of abuse of Polaroid of her naked body taken under duress. Why didn't he just say, I, I found pictures of a blonde woman. Was that you? And she goes, I think, I, I think you know the answer. Is this yes. you? Is this you? In a, you... Public, in a public park. It's, well, no, less that because it's clearly empty and they're very small. <laughs> that would have been funny if, a, if an old woman walked past and went, my, my. Bloody um, hell. <laughs> but just, is this you? Do you remember the worst time of your life? <laughs> Literally. And she's like, I thought I'd escaped him until you fucking showed up. You're safe now. But, th but then that moves to a nicer place of how did you get away? Somebody saved me too. Because she needs to know that he's dead. <laughs> For her to yeah. go see a, a, see see Christopher Plummer again, which is probably a single minute. Well, Beautiful. she yeah, she knew he was dead and the same before. Yes, that's true, but that might have been a ploy. Hmm. I don't know. Um, what's the change? Let's talk to, about the larger conversation. So this fil film pivots um, on a central, uh, very graphic um, rape scene uh, that. I've read all the contemporary art, well, all the contemporary articles I could find, mm -hmm. and there's and it's it's graphic, and it doesn't sit well with many people. My initial uh, <clears throat> Fincher's, we'll, we'll we'll discuss some points of view, and then we'll just get into it. Fincher's point of view is that um, he talked with multiple personal friends privately, who had experienced abuse about some of the more intricate. Points. For instance, he did in the script. Um, he was, you know, he talked to one person who said that uh, she would never be able to take the shirt off of the guy. She wouldn't want to look at his naked body again. And then there's another thing of she, he spoke to another uh, personal friend. It was like, oh no, 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 no. I would, you know, I needs the shirt. He needs to be fully naked. He needs to be as vulnerable as I was, um, as she was. Mm -hmm. Lots of conversations around it. And I, for me, I always think of, I, I then put that in the context of other depictions on screen. And it's, there's only, it's, it's very frequently, there's, you've got the Marnie shot. In Hitchcock's Marnie, there's a, there's a ter terrific film. And there's a terrifically well done scene where Connery, uh, <laughs> yeah, rest in peace, Sean Connery, uh, rapes uh, Tippi Hedren. And that, it's him zooming in and then it pans to Tippi Hedren's deadpan face, and then it pulls away. And this has that shot. This has the zoom down the hallway. And in most common films, that's where it had end. And then you get, and people always say the argument of, it's more disturbing that we don't see it. And that works as one argument, but also it is actually more disturbing to see it and we don't expect it and the fact that we go back and that we do see it brings it forward even more and it's not that it's not in the context of a wider violent film it's but i don't think it's unjustified by the plot i don't think it's unjustified uh by um the circumstances of the characters and i don't think it's unnecessary um there's lots of questions about how graphic it is. And obviously you get the payoff of how graphic it is with how graphic the revenge scene is. Um, what, what, what was your react, what was your, if you want to say your personal reaction and then sort of in a context of where you think this sits in the relationship with the film? Sure, yeah. So I, I would say unequivocally, probably the worst um, scene that I have watched in film. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. My issue isn't with the fact that it exists within the story. It mm. is purely the depiction of it. And I think as well, I mean, in essence, it's three separate scenes of rape slash assault because she does do the same thing back to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, whether it, you can say easily that it's justified. Mm. And... You're right in that it's even more brutal and it leaves more of an impact seeing it. But mm. the question is whether that 
is is necessary because mm. you know you talk about the incredible sound mixing and Rooney yeah. Mara's acting. Astounding. Her, yeah. her voice oh, yeah. in isolation, her voice acting, you could have had that alone with the the visual of the locked room and still like your blood would curl, you know? Yes, it would. Or even just a close up of her face just to spare us of the, the image as a whole because mm. I mean, there's always going to be discourse about how to depict things like this. And it's good that he um, spoke to people to get a, a broad view. But person, for me, it just took me out of it so much that it, like, it was a while before I could actually get back into the action and appreciate it mm. for what it was. And, mm. and again, it, it just meant that it made the revenge not even worth it in a sense like don't get me wrong i liked you know the blackmail mm. and the the tattooing was a brilliant touch because that was like 100 percent her that was her signature yeah whereas the rest of it you could argue where's the autonomy in that by just doing the exact same thing that he did and that and i think that's another element is that whether, you, whether we want to say Fincher's alien, Larson, whoever, but, you know, it's it's a, it's not a black and white movie, it's grey, in that it's it adds dimension to her character of Elizabeth, of like, oh, no, 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 no. The fact that we can't fully enjoy the revenge because that in itself is a horrifically brutal act that, again, Fincher forces us to watch mm -hmm. adds further dimensions for me of... And, you know, the unequivocal, I, I, a very frank and a very frank discussion I had with somebody who I watched this uh, film with. And, you know, they just said, you'll never know how horrifying that scene is. And um, they hadn't experienced it themselves, but it's, 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 a, um, it's a specifically uh, female brutal scene you know there's you know we, we don't need to say the obvious comments of course men can be raped there's no you know there's no mm -hmm. that sort of comment is you know unwarranted i feel that that's and that's a obvious yes but there's something about that abuse of power and yes. uh that the and the oppression of that um mm -hmm. that of course i will never understand um i don't think i don't think it dilutes the effect of the scene for me any I think it's certainly still bloody, bloody well grueling and affecting. Um, and I usually skip. I usually, I usually skip it. It's not, it's not, you know, I talk about rewatching this film, let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I, I, the, I think the first time I ever watched, I've only watched it properly twice, I think. And it was for this rewatch. And it was for, um, and then the other time I didn't even watch it properly. It was because of when I was watching it with the commentary track. And, and so, Fincher talking about it and Fincher's voice over that um, sort of, you know, dilute the brutal effect of it. Um, yeah, any, any, any other comments on this? Um, I think that covers it, really. I just think yeah. there, were, there were ways of, you know, conveying the brutality mm. because you don't, you don't need to tell us how awful it is as an event. No, of course, yeah. And, you know, for people who say... Oh, but it was necessary to to show how hard it was. Yeah. I would just pose the question: Okay, well, why why did Fincher not feel the need to show all of the brutal killings? Because we get the idea, we get the the, the gravitas of it through subtext, through people just talking about it. I think they don't show the brutal killings because none of them are happening in real time. Sure. But then, you know, you've had flashbacks already featured in this. Yes, but those flashbacks have never been, um, those flashbacks have never been about the the moving of the, well, they have been about the plot, obviously. Uh, but I think if you, you can't have flashbacks because it would reveal who the killers are. I mean, we're talking about machinations of a mystery plot instead of the, the context of, uh, of violence in the film, in the film sure. now. But... Um, 
yeah, no, I, I think it, it, again, no, no, it's an interesting point. I think it does. It doesn't hold back on the other aspects of violence in the film. I mean, the torture. Um, as stupid as it's, this is going to sound bizarre, but I think if there was a brutal killing that could be shown, it would be shown. <laughs> um, Potentially, yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, think, I think the thing that, that gets people with depictions of assault mm. as opposed to murder, you know, murder... We've been a bit desensitised to it. We've been yes. a bit desensitised to murder, yeah. And as stupid also, as that sounds. you know, you, you know that it's it's fake because that person's not really dead. Obviously, like, well, it, it's yes, acting no, but, either way. But yeah, Rooney Mara is, is not actually being assaulted. Yeah, it, it's acting either way, but it's still an unfortunate... I think it's just something we, we don't see. Out. I think it's just something we don't see. I think yeah. if... I mean, we do see. I mean, the accused... I mean, I'm not going to list... You know, you know that was never on Who Dares Wins with Nick Knowles movies with rape scenes in them. You know, there was never. You know, I'm not going to list them, but it, it is something that we have seen. But we're it's a, it's a very it's a larger conversation. But we are desensitized to murder. You were talking about how much you love true crime, and you know we're desensitized to it. We are used to murder. You know, shots and crime scene photos and depictions of murder. Um, I guess again, it's a it's a weird angle to take murder has is made has been made fun on screen so many times and killing has been made enjoyable so many times yeah. there's no enjoyable um you know you can't make an for instance you, you you know you can make a fun slasher horror movie there's no fun serial rape movie you can make um yeah and i suppose in a sense you, you that could be an argument for this depiction in the yeah there's no chance for her to be objectified. There's no opportunity for it to be framed from his perspective, as you do see a lot with um, killings. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, like the Ted Bundy biopic, Jeffrey Dahmer, etc. Yeah, yeah. So you, can you know, it's list very much forever. like here. You know, here is a list as long as your arm of women mm. that we will never see. The perspective of laid out in front of you so they and, are they are just props yeah. in this larger story whereas i think this film does a great job of making all of those props all these long listed women you know i mean it take elizabeth takes great care when mm -hmm. she's listing off the women she's like oh no they were this one was raped murdered and she keeps saying it and it's and it's almost that sort of there's a hint of boredom in her voice when she's listing all those women. And it's 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 such a brilliant image of her just and, you know, listing. When, when Daniel Craig is like, okay, that's that's enough now. We don't need I'm to not finished. He's like, no, these are all instances where this yeah. has happened to real people. Yeah. So, it's yeah. like, no, let's like, get back like to the that. mystery. Oh, wait, no, let's, no. Wait a minute. Let's talk about the real human nature of it. And you know we, you know, and the, and through the happy ending of, of Harriet being alive, uh, we get her side of the story and we get her story rather than yeah. it, it coming from Martin. Obviously, we have hints of the abuse. You know, Martin talks about it being their duty to serve their father, uh, but it's it's Harriet that tells us that story. Yeah, there's like no. The fact that she oh, gone. Solved it as well. Yeah. Like yeah. The fact that she solved. She fucking the case. belted him. Oh yeah. oh oh uh, oh Harriet oh Elizabeth Elizabeth. Um, well, both of them in their yes. own times. Obviously, Harry could go to public it. with um, with her findings, but mm. you know she did all the work, as did Elizabeth. Mm. So that's that's a nice. And although Michael, uh, sorry, and although Mikhail pips her to the post, figuring out it's Martin, um, Elizabeth figures out it's Martin of her own accord. Yeah, just in time as well, might I add? Oh yeah, perfect, perfect Hollywood magic. <laughs> I have a man watching her the thing. There's no easy way to tangent out of that, so enjoy this. What are your more picnicky uh <laughs> what are your smaller changes? <laughs> um I I I don't I wouldn't say I had any really. They're oh, all see? quite it's great, isn't it? Well no, they're all quite general changes. <laughs> um you know, cut the whole relationship, decide on a central plot. I thought the um, pacing was, was very exceptional range in the you know the the lead characters meet 
halfway through. Oh, and, yeah. I, and, you know, they, they, you have your reasons for it. But I just think they tried so hard to, you know, stay true to the novels mm. that it was hard to discern between what the, the really important moments were. Mm. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, what's left from uh, Reen's notes? Um, yeah, there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of plots. <laughs> um, like I say, this this movie had its merits, but and I, I could appreciate it. There's mm. the microwave. Uh, <laughs> I could appreciate it, but it was not my favourite. Uh, favorite of the Fincher thrillers. Oh no, I mean, I think that's the general opinion of most people. Yeah. And then over time, you're like, oh wait, that was really good. I think I wanna, yeah, I think I wanna watch that again. Well, I'll let you know if I come <laughs> to that conclusion. In 20 years, you'll come to London, <laughs> find me in London. Thomas, you were right all along. It's a brilliant movie. Last time I watched Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I didn't think it was very good, Thomas. Um, <laughs> right, right, found, that is found, exactly found. what I'll do. Uh, what's left from Tom's notes? <laughs> the 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 sadness of Steve Zalian talking in the behind the scenes about how they'll get to the other, how they'll get to the rest of her backstory. How sad. Um, uh, I love that Mikael trusts her wholeheartedly with fifty thousand Swedish kroner. He's just like, okay, it's a good advent, it's a good investment. I, that's another thing. It's like. He's he's you know facilitating uh is well yeah okay then he's facilitating that but um that's a level of trust that she hasn't ever known and that and yeah. that's where it comes from well anyway the, the yeah again like I don't have an issue with them you know becoming close and being able mm. to to bring out an, another side to each other I just don't see why it had to be sexual or romantic because they're both very sexy in the movie craig looks yeah. great with those glasses like... rooney's looks incredible <laughs> you know let him let him go what do i do with the girls that's a good question well before i do what we're doing sit down relax have a drink i like that part a lot having a chat with both of you now that one of you is going to die Afterwards, I just get rid of them, far out of sea. Unlike my father, who left them scattered all over the place like trophies. That's not very smart, if you ask me. He was a loud and garish man. Frankly, he got what he deserved. You can't be a sloppy technician like that. You can't drink to excess like he did. This takes discipline. It's a science of a thousand details. The planning, the execution. The cleaner. I guess I don't have to tell you, but you're going to create quite a mess. Here. <laughs> That's the thing. If it, if it wasn't a book adaptation, I would have just assumed that they'd gone. We need some something to get bums and seats. Let's get Daniel Craig with the shirt off. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, but also I say that they're both sexy in the movie. It's like realistic sexy. There's no like, there's no like big shot where we you know pan up and see her tattoo and it's you know it's all like oh look at me um you know and, and again and and there's no big he doesn't take off his shirt he's like dirty and he's like covered in blood and he's like Gross. he's like take off your wet clothes and she's like oh fuck yeah and he takes those clothes and he's like oh and then he can see his ass crack and he's like oh god i'm cold like it's dirty and it's also, real yeah, what does she see in him in that moment He's ah. literally in the bathtub, in the fetal position. Care. Well, like she sees the care. Maybe she's into, maybe it's like mm. broken wing syndrome. And it's like. Or she's just hypersexual after her abuse. And Dan McCraig is like, all right. He doesn't okay, know. So. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. I'll don't, give him that. Don't. Put that on Mikael Bromquist, honourable man. You're 23, we work together, and you're clearly dealing with some shit right now. He doesn't know that she's dealing with shit right now. The first time he her. She's the clearly first, deranged. The first time he meets her, she's had it off with, with, with a club girl who gave her E. Are they giving each other E? 
And having it off in the middle of a club. Oh my. Um, I love why that I? I love that it gives her ten thousand I don't love that it gives her ten thousand dollars for a rape, but I love that the um without that ten thousand dollars she wouldn't be able to get the three thousand uh, tattoo gun. Love that. And so he sort of sealed his own oh, fate. I didn't make that connection. That Very was good. good it is good. Um which leads us into uh, a few fun facts. Shh, let me ask you something. Why don't people trust their instincts? They sense something is wrong. Someone is walking too close behind them. You knew something was wrong. But you came back into the house. Did I force you? Did I drag you in? No. All I had to do was offer you a drink. It's hard to believe that fear of offending can be stronger than the fear of pain, but you know what? It is. And they always come willingly. And then they sit there. They know it's all over, just like you do. But somehow, they still think they have a chance. Maybe if I say the right thing. Maybe if I'm polite. If I cry, if I beg. And when I see the hope draining from their face like it is from yours right now, I feel myself getting hard. But you know, we're not that different, you and I. We both have urges. A satisfying mind requires more towels. Um, the pierce, she did all of her own piercings. Uh, multiple ear piercings, eyebrow and uh, nipple piercings. Uh, that <laughs> Rooney Mara, uh, they're not cosmetic. Uh, Mara got the piercings. They've specified including her nipple piercings. <laughs> it was actually not that painful. I thought that so, I thought. Oh, go on. Wait. So she got them herself, or she performed them herself? I think she got them. She said so it, she it, didn't like bow bow ooh, bow bow. <laughs> oh, I thought it was actually not that painful. I thought she has it in the book. She should have it in the movie. Because of all the tattoos and makeup and the piercings and the physical transformations my body has to go through, it would always feel sort of like I was in costume, even if I was naked. It just felt like a good one to get, a necessary one to get. The ear, ro the ear rose, nose, eyebrow and lip piercings were removed after shooting completed, but she kept the right nipple piercing uh, for possible sequels. It's not something I want to ever get re-pierced, so I'm going to keep it in. One older breath. <laughs> Uh, the movie was shot in Sweden during one of the coldest winters in over 20 years. Wow. Uh, people kept campaigning for Naomi Rapace to uh, reprise her role as Elizabeth. I'm very glad she didn't. Uh, Tim Miller, designer of the opening uh, titles, was asked to come up with some thoughts about what Elizabeth's nightmares would consist of. He came up with about 50 ideas, which were whittled down to 25. Miller was then, then given eight weeks to realise them. I, wow. where, why aren't they on my Blu-ray? I've got four hours of behind-the-scenes footage and I don't have them. Come on. Here's some other options for uh, Mikhail. Johnny Depp? No. Two, I don't know. Two... I feel like he would have been more likeable. But then do they, does he need to be? Does he, I don't think he needs to. I think, he, like I say, I think he needs to be Michael Douglas. He needs to be mm. a scumbag. And we're like, you're a scumbag. You're cheating on your wife. You're taking advantage of this assistant, not necessarily taking advantage of his, as we've discussed, or maybe he's taking advantage, who knows. Uh, but, um, and you're like, oh, but I still like you. You're like, you're like dirty and you're like an asshole, but you're mm. quite charming. And you keep, you manage to have your glasses by your ears. Uh, Vigo Mortensen, no. Brad Pitt, too squeaky clean. And George Clooney, uh, very much squeaky clean. Jo like George Clooney and Charlize Theron. Like, that's the Hollywood movie. And I love that yeah. it's Daniel Craig, who's obviously a huge star in 2011 because of the bombs. But, oh, it's, yeah. but he's not like, I don't know, he's not like, he, he's not like big, big. It's not Tom Hanks yeah. in big. <laughs> I Tom... wasn't massively convinced that Elizabeth would be attracted to him. I, I wasn't convinced that he was attracted. I, I'd be convinced that she was attracted to him. Maybe with um, Depp's Burton-esque features. <laughs> you want him to Edward Scissorhands it up. Yeah. Um, and 
then. Uh, it's in, in September 2011, a trailer for The Muppets was released. There was a spoof on the teaser trailer. Um, in one of the more harrowing scenes in the film, uh, Martin Wanger has made Mikael Blomkis bound and Orinoco flow plays. Uh, this choice came from uh, a discussion on the scene where, Mike, where Daniel Craig flicked through his iPod and called out the first song he found, which was initially met with a lot of laughter. A, Daniel Craig, fan of Enya? Okay. Uh, Surprisingly perfect, though. Oh, yeah, it's brilliant. It's a great choice. And also, as stupid as it sounds, it's like soothing. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. I don't know whether it's meant to be soothing for Martin or whether Martin's trying to be soothing for the victims. I mean, you're not going to be too soothing with, like, getting cut open. I think I'd, <laughs> I would be like, kill me now, please. I don't want to listen to any of you anymore. I fucking hate My Enya. big question mm. is... Uh, if you could cast Martin or recast him with any Muppet, who would it be? And there is a correct answer. <sighs> I'm going to say, well, first off, this could be, <laughs> this could, we could do this, we could do the whole cast. I think Henrik as both, <laughs> Henrik as Waldorf and Dirk Frode as Statler um, is, is a winner. It's a winning combination. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Aren't you a Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> they're all Nazis. <laughs> they're all Nazis, and they're not even, the, and he's not even the bad guy. <laughs> um, uh, I'd, I'd go, I'd go Kermit, because he needs to be likable and believable, oh and then it's a real reveal, and then it's a twist. I mean, I'm glad you avoided the the stereotype of Swedish chef. Oh yeah. <laughs> He plays everybody else. Um, he plays Lisbeth <laughs> Salad, the, the chef with the um, dragon tattoo. I thought Sam the Eagle. Because <laughs> of his kind of grandeur. Oh, Lena. Lena Anderson. No, he's too, he's too American. Yeah. Oh, and, then, and then the song that would play would be born in the USA. Um, <laughs> hey, Lena, Lena. <laughs> and I remember Lena. Live. <laughs> By the way, who finds me very conventional? <laughs> the science of those are dinners. Uh, David Fincher contributed the idea that Martin should have an old video camera and a reel-to-reel -reel tape player in his dungeon to suggest how long he has been kidnapping and murdering people in that room. This is a really dark Tom's big question. How many people has Martin killed? Well, this is the thing, because obviously there's recorded evidence of all of Gottfried's murders. Yes. But not Martin's. And, and that's Martin what makes says, it so horrifying. Martin says, you know, my father was sloppy. He left them lying around everywhere for people to find. I just Whereas take I them out not. to the middle of the sea and dump them. Terrifying. I'm a technician. Um, the use of the word technician. Great. I mean, it would, it would have to be like at least double what his father did. Oh yeah. Let's say let's That's be like upwards of ten. Let's say one a year. Let's say one a year. Godfrey dies in sixty seven. Let's let's be let's be conservative and give him three years to set up his dungeon. To set up his business. That's forty people. Oh God. And that's just one a year. And I and I don't think it's one a year. That is terrifying. It is. Frankly. Um, tagline, tagline rundown. Evil shall with evil be expelled. Hmm. Yeah. Good. Mm. What is hidden in snow comes forth in the thaw. Very nice. She's coming. <laughs> that was shit. <laughs> And the feel bad movie of Christmas. I like that's the, that's that's the real kicker of the teaser. That would be my personal tagline. <laughs> the feel bad movie of Christmas. Uh, Tom's, movie the, uh... Tom's big question: Who is the best performance that... in this film? I thought you had your big question. Oh no, yeah, I've got. I get everyone. lots of big questions. Uh, who is the what? Who is the best performance in this film? Uh, Rooney Mara. Yeah. All right. That's fair. Yeah. Stellan, close second. Sure. I, I can I can back that. 
that. I've put Craig glasses. <laughs> I don't know what the question is. <laughs> Just his glasses. Uh, Liv, um, he says, so So this woman that Stellan Skarsgård, who was with him in that first scene, he says that um, whilst we were all upstairs with Liv, who, by the way, finds me quite conventional, does that mean she's fully into it? Finds me, finds me quite conventional. Is she? Yeah. Or oh, maybe, maybe that was her way, his way of saying she suspects nothing. She thinks I'm so normal. Ah, uh, yeah. Conventional in the in the in the sense of like. He's it's a real north by northwest. You know, he's he's hanging off Mount Rushmore because it's been two hours of action, and he goes, "Why did your wives leave you? Because they thought my life was boring. Like they have no, like they have no idea." Um, <laughs> Obviously, this is a lot darker. Um, yeah. So Irina. Why, why does he have a wife? He doesn't have a wife. He... Oh, yeah. Which is, Liv knows all about my messed up family, which is why she'd never marry me. No, oh, it's not just that. <laughs> no, no. But then why, why is she even there? Because they're like, it's that, they're, they're like middle aged and they're just like, yeah, we're not married, but also. I'm not sleeping with anybody else. Then and again, I'll come and we'll have a nice dinner and we'll have a nice week. <laughs> uh, but we're both business people. They're they're both business people, aren't they? I mean, I'm I'm not going to open the the can of worms of trying to psychoanalyze a literal Nazi murder or rapist. Um, He's not a Nazi. Oh no, he is. He hates immigrants yeah. and yeah, and the Jews and yeah. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Hashtag, you don't need to wear the uniform to be a Nazi. That should be a, that should Hot have been a thing. From Tom. Hot take from Tom. Tom's big question. Do you have to wear a uniform to be a Nazi? What constitutes a Nazi? Enough about Nazis, unfortunately. Synops yeah, do you know what my synopsis for sequel is? Make a fucking sequel. It, okay, then. So Any you, sequel. So you hated that. Well, no, you didn't hate it. You appreciate You're like my mother when she watches Oscar movies and she's like, I can appreciate the acting, but I didn't like it. That's what she says. It were boring. Would you? So it gets. So it gets released. Mm -hmm. It gets released. Public announcement. They're making the girl who played with fire with Fincher, with Rudy Mara, with Daniel Craig. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you won't be speaking to me for a month because I'll be in a, a coma from the excitement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, 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 right, you're obviously going to go see it, so it's a stupid question, but would you be excited? No. <laughs> I would see would... it out of obligation to you. Okay. <laughs> just so I, I would watch it just so I could tell you how much I hated it. <laughs> yeah, but would you say that you hated this film? Um, you've been skirting around a lot. Obviously, you've been saying a lot of negative comments, but then you've been saying positive things. Would you say yeah. that you actually hated this film? One moment. I'm, to, I'm shrouded in darkness on the film. <laughs> she's back. She's she's now in in the light. Um, it, it's difficult. I like I say, it had its merits from a a cinematic mm. standpoint. I think it's very well made. Um, I didn't. It wasn't an enjoyable watch for me. Yeah. Um. And it, it, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's a film that doesn't let you look away. Yeah. And that's all I wanted to do <laughs> post that scene. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, not one that I enjoyed, but then, uh, like, in the, in the sequel, would they really feel the need to, like, hammer home with those same kind of brutal themes? Or would it just be an exploration of character well, the, the sequel, relationships the sequel follows it really it, it, it's it's weird because we're watching the we're watching the origin without getting the rest of the films because the rest the next film she's tracking down and dealing with a sex trafficking ring like it's it's again it's all about her stopping abusing men and it so it feels like it feels like you're watching an origin to something that you never get the payoff of so it yes so it feels like and, and and you know that's that's also in itself a played a bit of a played out um story of like woman you know 
abused. I mean, from uh, what is it? I spit on your grave. Like you know, abused woman gets her own back by becoming violent against men. And those sort of films are you know um, invigorating and exciting in their own right and empowering. Um, but also, it's it's you know it's a complaint a lot of Jews have with Inglorious Bastards in that like yeah no, it's great that they're killing the Nazis that's wonderful, but also the Jewish religion is 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 about peace and tolerance and um, you know yeah this is exciting I'm glad that we get to kill the Nazis, but also you know so yeah. I love the girl with the dragon tattoo. It's a tough one to say you love, but I feel I've I feel I've adamantly described why I love this film. You've played your case very well, I must say. Thank you. I you think like it, we, haven't, we haven't reached an impasse? Yeah, no, I feel I because I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. It's not it's not my favourite scene. <laughs> I skip it. I skip it myself. Yeah. Best ten minute stretch. Uh, you know, it's not. It's. I don't watch it for that, but I also don't think it's unnecessary. I think it's graphic. I don't think it's gratuitous. I think it's a film of. I think it's a film of. Um, I think this. I don't think this. I think this. I don't think this. Yeah, it's this. It's about finding the distinction, and you know, clearly, a lot of people are in agreement with you because even though it was a box office flop, it. It got nominated for a lot of awards. And lots of people want the sequel. People still want the sequel. We got we got the girl in the bloody spider's web. So basically, after Steve Larson passed, um, mm -hmm. one of his one of his friends um continued writing Elizabeth Salander books. And my grandma's read them and she says they're good. She says they're good. It feels they don't feel forced or or gratuitous uh, gratu not gratuitous, they don't feel forced or un uh, um you know, out of place. They feel like Larson's writing them, which is a weird phenomena. Um, and it characters Elizabeth along and, and Mikel. Um, and so they basically pinned the box office failure of this on the fact that people had already read the book and already seen the film. So they were like, okay, we'll make the girl in the spider's web because there's no film of that. And they cast Claire Foy and she's terrible. Not in not in other things, but she was really bad as Elizabeth. There was, you know, all the dimensions and all the wonderful stuff we're talking about, Rooney, and all the great stuff that you can say about Naomi. You just can't say any of it. You know, she, you know, it's like she dyed her hair and she got a few fake tats, and it was like, look at me, I'm Elizabeth Salander. And Fincher says it in the behind the scenes. He's like, yeah, no, Rooney did all the the weight loss and the the piercings and. You know that stuff will get you golden globes, but it doesn't interest me, and that's ex and and it clearly also doesn't interest Rudy Mara. She's clearly going for something so much more, um, and Girl in the Spider's Web's just just shit, and it makes it into an action movie, and yeah, the the chase scene in this is great, but it's punctuating a serious detective film. It would yeah. feel so weird if there was you know, 20 minute action scenes with a motorbike on ice. Don't get me started on the bloody girl and the spider's web. Um, just so disappointing. And the fact that we get that instead of, and it's not like Finch has been doing, I mean, what, he, he, he made he made House of Cards and obviously he basically, he basically created another thing. He created modern television as we know it with House of Cards and Mindhunter and that sort of mini series Netflix streaming boom. <laughs> you know, as well as being one of the finest directors of our era, he also did that. And so that sort of busied his time. He's back now and he's, he's talked about how he wants to make more movies. He feels like he owes it, which is great because you do owe it, David. And on that note, it stopped snowing. It's, you know what I'd recommend? Watching the girl with the dragon tattoo with a beautiful window where it's snowing. It makes you feel like you're in Heldestad. <laughs> Makes but of you feel course, like you're really there in the action. <laughs> but of course, you will never watch the girl with the dragon tattoo again. Uh, nope. Next week's next week's Gone Girl, uh, a more enjoyable film, <laughs> a far more watchable film, um, fun for for everybody else. However, me, I love the girl with the dragon tattoo. I love the Swedes, and I love a two hour and forty mystery. No, sorry, I love a two hour twenty mystery thriller. 
and then I love a 20 minute espionage <laughs> <laughs> espionage film about German bank practice. Rian, any, I mean, you said your final thoughts. I've then went on to a spider's web. Uh, <laughs> I have indeed. I feel like your your feelings about the spider's web kind of match mine about dragon oh, tattoos. So. Well, honestly, what if you watched the girl in the spider's web, mm-hmm. you would be like, "Oh, he's so right," and I hate it. <laughs> Maybe dragon. so, but it wouldn't change my opinion of this. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. And that is, as they say, that. Oh, nearly ended the meeting instead of ending recording. <laughs> this is as they say that. Da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-da.